Tonight, indigents of Sangana in Bayelsa State protest impact of gas leak from an oil rig in their community. Call for urgent intervention to save their livelihood. Zamfara State Government to lift suspension of telecommunication services in the state from Monday as residents of Kaduna narrate their experience during similar shutdown in their state. Nigerians in UAE applaud federal government's decision to lift its ban on Emirates Airline, speak of impact on their businesses and careers. And UK, Germany and Italy confirm cases of the new Omicron strain of COVID-19 all linked to travel from Southern Africa. On business news tonight, OPEC and its allies set to hold their last meeting for 2021 amid renewed concerns over global oil market following U.S. planned release of 50 million barrels of oil and the new COVID-19 variant. On sports news tonight, Nigeria's D Tiger bounced back from their opening game defeat to beat Mali in their second group game of the FIBA Basketball World Cup African qualifiers. As residents of Sonny Kiri in Bielsa State continue to grapple with the impact of the oil spill in their community, resulting from the blowout of the Santa Barbara wellhead belonging to Iteo, another community also in Bielsa State is protesting a similar incident in their area. Indigents of Sangana community in Brass local government area are seeking urgent intervention from the Bielsa State and the federal governments over the gas discharge from an oil drilling rig, which they say is killing the fish in their waters. According to them, all efforts to get the attention of the government as well as the owners of the drilling rig have been unsuccessful. Sangana is a riverine oil-producing community in Brass local government area in Bayelsa State. The major occupation here is fishing, and the death of the fishes and other aquatic life is a huge threat to the survival of the people. On Monday, November 1st, some fishermen from Sangana observed gas emitting from the drilling rig located on the Sangana High Sea, said to belong to Con Oil. Dead fish are seen floating on the sea. The people say it's been over three weeks of seeking intervention from the owners of the drilling rig, the state and federal government, to no avail. Uh, we have been trying as much as we could to get to the company uh, corn oil in order to give us some kind of uh, maybe uh, a solution to their problems. But up to now, all we try to do to no avail. The community need medical attention. We cannot go to fishing anymore. Our aquatic life is damaged. We cannot go to river. So we need re relief materials to take care of our very selves. Our compensation. To further send their message across, they've embarked on a speedboat protest and shut down operations of the facility emitting the gas. We have shut them down and we've asked them to keep it shut down until we are settled. We want the government to come right now to save the people of Sangana Kingdom, the indigenous and residents of Sangana. We are dying. We have evacuated a lot of people. These people you see here, they are very scanty. The chairman of the Community Development Committee says although the emission of gas has stopped, active fishing activities are yet to commence. It is not only a campaign time, governor or, or candidate will come to our land. This is the time we need the state government to come to our aid. Yes, we have seen that the federal government has abandoned us, and they are the ones who gave the licenses to this uh, oil company. They have recorded all their personnel within uh, the first six hours of the incident, and it took them, I think, 22, 23 days to, to finally sort it down. The people are calling on relevant authorities to compel con oil to do the needful, as the community is on the verge of losing its main source of livelihood. Meanwhile, the National Environmental Standards Enforcement Agency, NESREA, has developed a compliance monitoring information system to ensure useful environmental information for governance in the country. According to the Director General of NESREA, Professor Ali Ujaru, 
The system incorporates the use of electronic recording system during environmental compliance monitoring inspection as a means for consolidating different data into one source for better accessibility. He made the disclosure at the 15th National Stakeholders Forum in Abuja. And to security, the Zamfara state government says the embargo on telecommunications in the state will be lifted from Monday, November the 29th. The decision to suspend the measure, according to Governor Bello Matawale, is as a result of successes recorded in ensuring peace in the nooks and crannies of the state where there had been bandits' attacks. While making the announcement at the state APC convention held at the trade fair complex in Gusol, the state capital, he also thanked the people of the state for their patience and perseverance throughout the trying period and assured that his administration will continue to take measures to preserve peace and protect lives and property. Well, the announcement by the Zamfara state government uh, to lift the suspension on telecommunication services comes a day after the Kaduna state government did the same after more than a month. Although the government says the restoration of full services in the affected areas may unfold over a few days, Kaduna residents have been reacting to the development and how the shutdown affected them. As part of operational measures to contain banditry and kidnapping in various parts of Kaduna State, the government in October this year shut down GSM network in about five local government areas in the state. The affected areas are Chikun, Igabi, Berningwari, Giwa and Kaduna South local government areas. While residents developed various coping strategies over the network shutdown, bandits still carried out isolated attacks, especially on the Kaduna Abuja Highway. But the government says the mobile telephone shutdown, which lasted for more than a month, was largely successful from the military tactical point of view, a development that has prompted the government to lift a ban on telecommunication services. Residents are advised that the restoration of full services in the affected areas may unfold over a few days as the service providers mobilize to power and boost their transmission systems accordingly. Notwithstanding, the state government says other security containment measures, including the prohibition of motorcycles, all over the state remain. The restoration of telecommunication services in the state has been welcomed with mixed feelings by the residents who narrate their experiences. Uh, we tend to have uh, relative peace on that road uh, because uh, perhaps the telecommunication uh, shutdown uh, worked. Uh, but all the same, there are also complaints from some pockets of complaints from other people that uh, even when the shutdown, when the telecom services was, uh, was suspended, the bandits kept on with their kidnapping and other uh, criminal acts. Uh, but all the same, we must commend the security. It has really affected me in the sense that uh, I couldn't keep in touch with my loved ones, my family. Like personally, I stay in Kaduna, my wife stays in Kanu. So you see, if, if except I look for network and call her, she can't get me. It has been a challenge because I couldn't reach my family. Mr. Gilbert Gado believes the state government can do better than restricting network. I think there should be better strategies to go about this rather than taking out the whole network of an entire local government on, and making people to be uh, frustrated in trying to get networks so that they can be able to do their business and, and also carry on on their daily activities. The Kaduna state government says despite the recent security breach on the Kaduna Abuja highway that resulted in the kidnapping of some travelers and the death of one person, the ongoing military operations against bandits remain in full force. Meanwhile, the police in Kaduna, in collaboration with other security operatives, say they have killed a notorious bandit in Chikun local government area of the state. In a statement by its spokesperson, the command explains that, acting on incredible intelligence, the operatives raided a facility in Sabun Tasha area in Chikun local government, where the suspected bandits were said to have lodged. 
The statement adds that while the raid was on, the suspected bandits on sensing danger tried to shoot their way to escape, leading to a gun duel with the security agents. The notorious bandit was said to have been wounded in the shootout and was thereafter taken to the hospital, but was confirmed dead on arrival by a medical doctor. Well, the Anglican Primate Most Reverend Henry Ndukuba says the decision to declare bandit groups operating in parts of a country as terrorists is long overdue. A federal high court in Abuja had granted an application by the Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice requesting an order to declare bandits as terrorists. The decision, the minister said, the government is ready to act upon. The Anglican Primate, who spoke on the sideline of the Anglican Church 2021 annual Carnival for Christ in Abuja, says... The decision of the court is in tandem with the calls from many Nigerians considering the level of pain and destruction perpetrated by the groups. We are indeed very perturbed when the bandits had the audacity to enter into where we train our elite security, the military, and we're able to capture and go away with and then we start negotiating. I think it is a great compromise. Justice delayed is justice denied. In fact, this is what we have been calling for right from the very beginning. But they have played politics with it and, and uh, called them bandits instead of terrorists. And to health matters now, the Ebony state government has debunked reports of deaths in some communities in the core local government area following a reported outbreak of a disease suspected to be cholera. The state commissioner for health, Dr. Daniel Lamazurike, who briefed the media in Abakaliki, said investigations revealed that only four persons were found to be sick and upon a visit to the communities, those examined had no sign of cholera. He assured people in the area that adequate measures have been put in place to avert the spread of any form of disease in a core local government area and other parts of the state. You have to establish that there is cholera before you can say that the deaths were attributed to the cholera. So right now we cannot establish uh, any uh, relationship, any correlation, because we cannot establish that there is any clinical outbreak of cholera. We are still carrying out the laboratory investigation, whether it's a new disease or whether it's just uh, uh, you know, fake uh, news and rumors. But there's no, clinically, we have not established anything that looks like uh, color in that community. In part two after the break, Nigerians in UAE applaud federal government's decision lifting its ban on Emirates Airline as a speak on the impact on their businesses and careers. Join us again. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Indigens of Sangana in Bayelsa stage protest impact of gas leak from an oil rig in their community. Zafar state government to lift suspension of telecommunication services in the state from Monday as residents of Kaduna narrate their experience during similar shutdown in their state. Well, Nigerians in the UAE speak on the impact of the Emirates Airlines suspension on their businesses following federal government's decision lifting the ban. And UK, Germany and Italy confirm cases of the new Omicron strain of COVID-19, all links to travel from Southern Africa. Governor Abdullahi Suley of Nasaro State has flagged off another round of COVID-19 mass vaccination in the state to scale up efforts in curbing the spread of the virus. This comes as data from the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency shows that the percentage of vaccinated residents is below 10% of the targeted population. <laughs> Thank you. 
Governor Abdullahi Suli, accompanied by the executive director of the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, Dr. Faisal Schwab, flag off the mass vaccination campaign in Nasarawa State. Records at the National Primary Health Care Development Agency reveal that 8.1% of the targeted population in the state have been vaccinated with the first dose. Only 5.3% of the vaccinated population have received their second dose. As it stands, we have only been able to vaccinate 8.1% of eligible Nasarawa state residents with the first dose and only 5.3% are fully vaccinated with the second dose. While this is better than what most states have achieved, it is still below our target, which is to vaccinate all eligible residents before the end of 2022. As part of strategies to scale up COVID-19 vaccination in the state, Governor Abdullahi Suley is increasing vaccination points and taking other measures to ensure that citizens are vaccinated. We took the first vaccination seriously and I was among the first actually to take mine. In fact, I've taken the first one just like Dr. Ear. I've taken the second one. If you are ready to give me the third one today, I'm ready to take that third one. And I'm happy the head of service is also here. You have to take so many steps and ensure everybody is getting this. Apart from the non-pharmaceutical interventions recommended by the WHO, vaccines remain the only potent protection against the deadly COVID-19 virus, while assisting countries around the world reduce infection rate and hospitalization. Well, outside the shores of the country, reactions are beginning to trail the federal government's decision to lift its ban on Dubai carrier Emirates Airline. A Nigerian resident in the Middle Eastern country whose businesses and careers have suffered setbacks as a result of the ban applaud the new development and hope that this piece will be a lasting one. Correspondent Mayawa Digoke tells us more in this report. UAE, removing some of the conditions for travel to which we had concerns about. And having done so, and being the only impediment to their operations, we think it is also necessary for us lift the ban on operations of Emirates into the country. For the first time in eight months, Nigerians in the UAE can heave a sigh of relief, as this announcement signals hope that life would soon return to normal. It is like a new pet in the heart of all Nigerians in the UAE, because uh, this is a long awaiting news we ought to have heard, and uh, we must say it is a welcome development. Nigeria's Ministry of Aviation says this decision was reached after painstaking negotiations and the removal of travel restrictions on Nigerians by the UAE. The ban first came into full effect in March following Nigeria's objection to a UAE-imposed COVID-19 protocol requiring Nigerian travelers to take a rapid antigen test. The disagreement would eventually deteriorate into a diplomatic impasse. Nigerian entrepreneurs say business, which has been poor until now, will get a much needed boost. I was on my phone uh, last night and uh, I think it was around six minutes or thereabout when I saw the, the update, the breaking news then, I was so happy. Even I posted it to one of my group chats because we've been waiting for this Emirate to open so that we can travel easily. Honestly, I must tell you, we are so happy for this. I thank uh, the UAE government for the lifting. I also appreciate our country, Nigeria. It's not easy. It was because people are not coming. Then business is down. It was but uh, since the lift of the van, I think everything will be is very soon. Meanwhile, other Nigerians who have been unable to obtain work permits since June 
say they hope this new development would mean a change in their situation. After five months, life has been hard. So the only thing I could do was just to be hopeful. And since they announced it yesterday, honestly, I'm hopeful and I'm praying that they just, they just leave the van. In Nigeria's announcement, the UAE will no longer require an antigen test by Nigerians. Fingers crossed, this would give Nigerian residents of the UAE good enough reason to join in its 50th anniversary celebrations next week as they wrap up a hard year on a good note. From Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, Maya Wadigoke for Channel's Television News. Well, back home, the Board of Trustees of the Osborne Foreshore Phase 2 Estate is urging the Lagos State Government to carry out an audit of construction sites in the estate. The residents are appealing to appropriate authorities in the state to enforce the extant laws to stop contraventions of the state building codes. Our correspondent, Darido, reports. Residents of Osborne Foreshore 2 Estate in the area of Lagos have renewed their call for the stoppage of all infractions and also seeking for a detailed planning audit and structural integrity appraisal of developers' projects in the estate. The resident association says it is worried about clear violations of the state building codes, insisting that their efforts are geared to us for stalling possible disaster in the estate. Looking for sanity in our estate and ensuring that Human rights is respected, ensuring that people get what they are supposed to get. The kernel of this press conference is to highlight the untold activities of some developers in our estate who glaringly contravene all known approval orders and claim to have the appropriate planning approval from Lagos State regulatory agencies. All requests by Osborne Foreshore Residence Association Office to cite the planning approval author authorizing their development is always rebuffed. Density level, absence of parking provision, building a recovered per plot of land, the 9 meter setback and 6 meter airspace provision violation, encroachment into public land are listed as some of the infractions. We are talking about overbuilding here in. Uh, Osborne Phase 2. The number of transformers that we provided for are limited. Interestingly, we did not have a central sewage system. Everyone was to provide his own um, um, sewage treatment, you know, um, and we did not expect that we'll be having high-rise buildings here. If you drive through the estate now, all the infrastructures are broken. All the drainages are broken. The drainages don't flow anymore. And even the outfalls that we have for um, drainage into the lagoon have been some filled in many Places. Most of the developers who are developing properties in the Koyi, VI, and, and the Banana Zone are doing it purely as a business um, uh, endeavor. These buildings don't come cheap. They go for as much as one, 180 million naira. So you are not bridging anything there. A stakeholders meeting held in March to address the issues did not yield expected results. The estate has also submitted a petition to the Lagos State Physical Planning and Building Control Appeals Committee and awaiting feedback, hoping to put this episode behind them. Dari Idu, Channels Television News. When the news at 10 returns, federal government moves to check illegal tax collections and transportation of agricultural commodities across the country. Stay with us. The United Nations is of the opinion that Nigeria is long overdue for another census to help the government in its economic development plans for the people, particularly the vulnerable in the society. The United Nations Undersecretary and Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, 
Dr. Natalie Kanem, who made the advocacy during a courtesy visit to the Edo State Government House in Benin City, also believes that a better life for the girl child will reduce childbirth mortality. On his part, Governor Godwin Abasaki says government is not making enough efforts to check population growth, which according to him could cause more harm than good if not properly addressed. It has indeed been since 2006 since we've had a census in the country. And Ola Muller, our country representative based in Abuja, has already brought in one of the top experts in the world on fair count of, sec of census. I would appeal to you in your governorship to help us to assure the public that census is nonpartisan, that it is transparent, and that it's important to know who is being left behind. If we're going to lift up that 10-year-old girl in her village that's looking to all of us to wish her of an education, to plan for her to be able to have health care and appropriate information as she grows up. If we do not do something about controlling population growth, we will not be able to, no matter how, you know, there will be such a huge gap between our capacity to narrow the, 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 the growth rates with population, our population growth rate. Yes, we could turn the 200 plus million people we have today into a huge economic asset if we manage that growth. But if we don't and our light to continue to grow, it will continue to play catch up for decades to come. So for us in government, it's a big risk that we must now begin to address and put our hands around. Um, and so from that standpoint, we believe in what you're doing and we will need guidance and support on how to make sure that this issue becomes prominent and topical on the agenda. The federal government is making moves to check the indiscriminate collection of taxes on agricultural commodities across the country. Well, to achieve this, the government has established the National Transit Insurance Scheme, NATIS, and the National Anti-Multiple Taxation Scheme, NAMTAX. Well, speaking at the launch of the schemes, the Minister of Special Duties, Senator George Akume, explains that the government will not tolerate the trend as the unstructured collection is making the price of agricultural commodities rise. In aviation matters, the Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria says it has suspended some officials caught extorting a passenger at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos. The officials, who are staff of Aviation Security and Customer Service Departments of the Authority, were immediately suspended while the on-duty card of their accomplices from the Nigerian Immigration Service has been withdrawn. According to Fan, this action was taken to serve as a deterrent to other bad eggs in the system that are bent on tarnishing the image of the nation. With 12 finalists participating in the JA Nigeria Company program, Caratera Student Company for Secondary School Aquibum has now emerged winner of the contest. The competition is organized by Junior Achievement Nigeria in partnership with First Bank Nigeria to empower young entrepreneurs through its annual flagship event, the National Company of the Year competition. The winner is expected to represent Nigeria at the African Company of the Year competition in the first quarter of next year. The journey of eight months has now come to an end for students from the various secondary schools across the country who have participated in the Jan Nigeria Company program competing for the title of National Company of the Year. We are back on a voluntary environmental sanitation. It's a gathering of largely virtual audience and the organizers say the competition serves as a platform for the students to develop profitable business solutions that will address challenges in the society. We strongly believe in the boundless potential of the Nigerian youth. And the 12 student companies we are going to meet here today have exhibited just that. They have worked so hard to get here today and we celebrate their innovation and grit as we crown the winner today. What better way to build a nation 
than to equip young people with entrepreneurship skill set and mindset to inspire self-belief despite the increasingly daunting economic challenges which we all acknowledge. We at First Bank go beyond the call of duty to ensure support for JA Nigeria in preparing the youth for the future of work. After review of pitches from the student companies, the judges explained the selection criteria for the winner as well as an assessment of the work of participants. The first stage is to look at the annual report of the company that was submitted and we looked at the project management tools um, utilized. Uh, we look at the implementation of the digital marketing. Um, we looked at also the financial report. Kids are being exposed to skills that they will need, you know, as they grow. It's great that junior achievement can not only prepare them for the future, but also give them the skills that they need, preparing them for the future of work and also for their future. Twelve teams are now down to three, and the Keratara Student Company for the secondary school Aquibum were the producers of the Keratara bags and purses emerge winner. Congratulations, we are proud of you. We want to hear from you. Thank you very much. We are so happy to be the Acoy winner for this year. Thank you so much, Jay, and thank you, Tess, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Aquibum. Thank you so much. We are very happy. <laughs> The organizers say the program has positively impacted thousands of people across the country in teaching them how to generate wealth and giving the young ones a fair shot at becoming successful entrepreneurs. Now to not so exciting news. Wife battery is the most common form of domestic violence as stories abound about how husbands turn their wives into punching bags arising from mostly unresolved conflicts. But in this next report, our correspondent, Bukola Samuel Wemimo, flips the script and tells the story of two men who suffered physical and emotional abuse inflicted by their women. It is not very often that husbands battered by their wives open up to family members, let alone to an unknown third party. But the survivors in this story chose to seek help. Put her knees on my grind. In order to protect the identity of the children of the survivors, most of whom are minors, the two men who have suffered domestic violence allegedly inflicted by their partners have spoken on condition of anonymity. Survivor A began living with his now estranged partner in 1999. The union, albeit a tumultuous one, produced six children. According to him, all was rosy until he resigned his job and began working independently. Survivor A describes his wife as vicious, who had many times in the past instigated their children against him to the point of violence. They were coming back at me, coming back at me, and the mother just stood smiling. I was looking. So eventually, as I was trying to, you know, they would rescue me to the ground, I would get up, you know, it's my kids now. So I was trying to get up, and I just saw through the side of my eye, I saw the mother come behind me. And as I was struggling to obtain my balance, she just pulled my leg from the back. And I fell over backwards. Survivor B here says by reasons of divine restraint, he never married his partner, whom he also accuses of physical violence. He is convinced that he may have been under a spell cast by her. Even when it came to some situations, someone will insult your mother right now, insult you badly, something nobody would take. And all you have at the back of your mind. You want to sleep with her. Survivor B fingers his estranged partner for taking their six-year-old daughter to witch doctors many times for yet unknown fetish aims. Taking her to a place where they put live catfish on her head. They killed the live catfish and the blood to put on her head, her hands. Through his ordeal, Survivor A documented a body of evidence showing his injuries from domestic violence allegedly perpetrated by his wife. Experts have identified intimate partner violence to be about the tendency of one spouse to wield control over the other. The executive secretary of the Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Unit says it is also about patriarchy. Patriarchy is everybody's enemy. Patriarchy is not just an enemy of women. It's the fact that, you know, one gender is superior to the other and a gender 
here now the boy or the man is not able to express himself so that even when he's feeling abused if his spouse is abusing him physically emotionally or otherwise patriarchy shame the society will not allow him to come and speak out survivor a sought help from the dsvrt how did his quest turn out i went to complain you are telling me i should pay for your phone call because you made phone call to call somebody i came to complain about i think they see more opportunity for themselves in helping women the executive secretary of the dsvrt responds to the allegations of gender bias and levity leveled against welfare officers under her unit i know that there's no system that is perfect right but i think that we need feedback to improve on our services i know that social welfare's mandate is the welfare access maintenance of the children when contacted for comments on this report the nigerian police authorities in lagos appealed for time before they could respond survival a's wife refused all entities for a formal on the record interview in his own case survivor b was so afraid of the repercussions of involving his ex-lover because according to him she would take the fallout of the on their child who happens to be in her custody Many more men may be suffering domestic violence at the hands of abusive women, but will choose silence because of society's expectations, but even more so because of the agonizing and costly justice system. Amid all these, the stark reality is this, intimate partner violence knows no gender, and ultimately, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Vukola Samuel Wemimo, Channels Television News. Well, it's time for the latest business stories, and here's Teniola Shabawali. Thanks a lot, Kaede. Welcome to Business News. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies are set to hold their final meeting for 2021 to discuss production policy for the coming year. The two-day gathering begins on December the 1st for OPEC members only and December the 2nd for OPEC+. Plus. The meeting comes following the U.S. planned release of 50 million barrels of oil from its strategic petroleum reserve and the plunge in oil prices on Friday after reports of a new variant of coronavirus raised fears over demand. Meanwhile, key OPEC member Iraq says it does not have any expectations about whether the current monthly increase in supply of 400,000 BPD by the group will stay in place. The central bank governor, Mr. Godwin Emefele, says Nigeria's growth has returned to the level it was before it got hit by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Emefele, who made this known at the 56th annual dinner of the Chartered Institute of Bankers held in Lagos, also highlighted some of the efforts made by the central bank and the federal government towards the country's economic recovery. I'm delighted to note that growth has returned to pre-COVID levels due to the accommodative policy support provided by the CBN and our government. Notwithstanding these positive indicators, our economic growth remains fragile as our unemployment and inflation rate remains at levels that are not very supportive of growth. Second, continued implementation of our intervention efforts would need to be undertaken to sustain the recovery efforts and stimulate further growth of the economy. Third, given the population growth rate of about 2.7% annually, it is important that we continue to deploy measures that will enable our economy to attain annual growth rate of above 5%. Now, we also do intend to mobilize international capital. A key challenge to supporting the growth in key sectors of our economy is access to large pools of cheap investment capital. Today, over $100 trillion is held by institutional investors in OECD countries, 
most of it invested in low yielding assets relative to high yielding opportunities in Nigeria. And working to tap into this pool of funds will require the setup of an investment framework that offers comfort and security to investors seeking to invest in critical sectors of our economy. As a result, the CBN is working, is working to set up the International Financial Center at a core Atlantic city in Lagos that will serve as a hub for attracting domestic and external capital which is needed to strengthen our post-COVID economy. Our International Financial Center, when fully operational in the second quarter of 2022, will help to position Nigeria as a key destination for investment in Africa. And now investors in the domestic stock market have gained 54.02 billion naira this week as the last minute rally on Friday counted the losses recorded in three trading sessions. The 0.25 and 0.24% week to date gain in index and market value is largely credited to 3.83% advance on Airtel Africa share price as the year to date return moderates to 7.54%. Despite the bullish return on the index this week, market sentiment was negative as with 29 gainers led by University Press PLC against 36 losers led by UPDC. Similarly, sectoral performance cross sectors tracked was broadly bearish this week as all sectors closed negative except the insurance counter, which recorded more than 3% growth. Meanwhile, the volume of equities traded on the NGX this week advanced by 146.72%, and this comes largely from the shares of Owando, FBN Holdings, and Guarantee Trust Holding Company. And that's business news tonight. It's back to Coyote for the rest of the news at 10. Well, thank you, Tenny. Still ahead on the news at 10. UK, Germany and Italy confirm cases of a new Omicron strain of COVID-19, all linked to travel from Southern Africa. Stay with us. Well, let's now join Chris Alems for the latest sports stories. Welcome to Sports News. Nigeria's D Tiger uh, bounced back from an opening game defeat to, against Cape Verde on Friday to record their first win at the 2023 FIBA Basketball World Cup African Qualifier Phase 1 today. Led by Captain Ike Diogu, Nigeria secured a 72 to 70 point win over Mali. Diogu and Jordan Ogudira scored a game high of 19 points each, including six rebounds from the captain and one assist. Ben Uzo added 11 points with seven assists. The D Tigers will wrap up the first phase qualifier on Sunday when they square up against Uganda in the final group game. The Gymnastics Federation of Nigeria says the fortune of the sport in the country is set for change for good as coaches and judges participate in a workshop at the Samuel Ogbemudia Stadium in Benin City, the other state capital. The president of the Federation, Prince Kelvin Erunse, believes the refresher courses organized by the Global Federation will help Nigerian coaches compete among the best in the world. And in the English Premier League, Bukayo Saka and Gabriel Martinelli were on target as Arsenal edged past Newcastle United to nil. Mikel Ateta's side saw their right, their eight-game unbeaten run end at Liverpool last weekend, while Newcastle are the only winless team in England's top four tiers after 12 games. Sakai eventually broke the deadlock after 56 minutes, while substitute Martinelli added a second just 93 seconds after his introduction as Arsenal moved level on point with fourth-placed West Ham, who play Manchester City on Sunday. 
And that's it on sports. Back to you, Carly. Well, thank you, Chris. The United Kingdom, Germany and Italy have confirmed their first two cases of the new Omicron strain of coronavirus. The variant has prompted several countries to impose restrictions, such as travel bans on several Southern African countries. Omicron, designated a variant of concern by the World Health Organization, is potentially more contagious than previous variants, although experts do not know yet if it will cause more or less severe COVID-19 compared with other strains. Britain, Germany and Italy have become some of the latest countries to report cases of the new Omicron variant of the coronavirus which was first detected in South Africa last week. Amid fears that the variant has the potential to be more resistant to the protection offered by vaccines, the British Prime Minister has announced a number of new to measures in a, in to be introduced much, in the country. Anyone arriving in the UK will now be asked to take a PCR test and they will have to self-isolate until they provide a negative test result. We need to slow down the seeding of this variant in our country. We need to buy time for our scientists to understand exactly what we're dealing with and for us to get more people vaccinated and above all to get more people boosted. Meanwhile, 61 people who arrived in Amsterdam on two flights from South Africa have tested positive for COVID-19. The cases were discovered among around 600 passengers. Officials are now conducting further tests to see whether any are infected with the new variant. In the last few hours, many countries around the world, including the US, Canada and Australia, have restricted travel from the southern African region against the advice of the World Health Organization. South Africa has criticized the rush to impose restrictions, calling them draconian and unjustified. The health ministry says the country is being punished rather than being applauded for the discovery of the new strain. Omicron has been dubbed a variant of concern by the World Health Organization. It's potentially more contagious than previous variants of the disease, and scientists are racing to understand its mutations and find out whether current vaccines are effective against it. At least 19 people have been killed and 20 more injured after a passenger bus traveling on a highway in central Mexico crashed into a house. According to local media, the brakes on the bus which was heading to a local religious shrine in the state of Mexico failed. State officials are yet to release their account of the accident. Assistant State Interior Secretary Ricardo de la Cruz Musalem says the injured were transferred to hospitals, including some by air. And the main news again. Residents of Sangana in Bayosa State have protested the debilitating impact of gas leak from an oil rig in their community. They appeal to relevant authorities for urgent intervention to save their livelihood. Also today, Nigerians in the UAE applauded federal government's decision to lift the ban on Emirates Airline after about eight months' hiatus. And that's the news at 10. Thank you for watching. I'm Kaya Kikulu. Good night.